Thank you very much for coming along tonight to the uh, 2017 Memorial John G. Lecture. Um, and uh, we are at the National Security College and in partnership with the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre uh, at the ANU. Always absolutely delighted to hold this event uh, in memory of a real pathbreaker in terms of Australia's non-proliferation efforts and Australia's diplomacy more broadly. Let me very briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Matthew Sussex uh, and I'm the Academic Director uh, here at the NSC. And uh, we are particularly um, uh, happy and thankful for the support today of the College of Asia and Pacific. And I'd like to acknowledge Professor Michael Wesley, the Dean of CAP, uh, who's come along to hear our speaker tonight, Scott Sagan. Shortly, uh, I will introduce Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, the Chancellor of the ANU, who will in turn give some remarks uh, about John G to uh, frame the, uh, the lecture that follows from Scott. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on today, the Ngunnawal people, and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Chancellor of the ANU, Gareth Evans, needs absolutely no introduction to uh, any Australian or even overseas audience, uh, particularly on the topic of arms control and weapons of mass destruction. Um, Professor Evans, of course, is Australia's former foreign minister, uh, and, uh, and former diplomatic person, uh, still has many things to say on this topic. Uh, and uh, we are delighted to have him here tonight. It's a real honour to have him open the John G. Memorial Lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, Gareth Evans. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. And welcome to you all, especially the members of John G.'s family. His widow Liv, his daughters Rebecca, Chrissy, his son Nicholas, and his sisters Nikki and Rose, and I think some other members of the extended family as well. Welcome to you all to this 2017 John G. Memorial Lecture to be delivered by Scott Sagan, who I'll introduce in a moment, and which is, as you've heard, hosted this year by the ANU National Security College, uh, headed by Rory Medcarves, unfortunately ill and unable to join us tonight, but thanks very much, Matthew, for standing in, with the support of the College of Asia and the Pacific and uh, Michael Wesley, the Dean, who will be winding up tonight's proceedings. This lecture honours each year the memory of a man who made an extraordinary contribution to making the world a safer and saner place, in particular with his tireless and really quite brilliant work in bringing to a conclusion the Chemical Weapons Convention, and then even more tirelessly, in many ways brilliantly, in implementing it in practice through the Office for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCWC, OPCW rather, an institutional achievement uh, that was recognised worldwide with the award to the OPCW of the 2013 Nobel Peace Prize. It's one of the many tragedies of John G's early death that he didn't live to enjoy that recognition which is not an exaggeration to say would not have occurred without his own remarkable work. As I've described before in chairing these annual lectures, I first became aware of John's professional work back in the mid-1980s when as the Chemical and Biological Weapons Desk Officer in the Disarmament Division of the Department of Foreign Affairs, he was responsible almost single-handedly for the establishment of the Australia Group which was founded in the wake of the use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein in the Iran-Iraq war, with the objective of denying access by countries of proliferation concern to chemicals and biological agents, to precursors and dual-use equipment. In the mid-1980s, again, John started to take a close interest in the long-stalled negotiations of the Chemical Weapons Convention and working closely with defence science and technology scientists, Bob Matthews, with us here again tonight, and Shirley Freeman, drafted the critical part for the acceleration of those negotiations, focusing particularly on the need to get industry support for a, an effective verification regime. That effort, with which I became very closely associated as foreign minister after 1988, ultimately bore fruit in the conclusion of the convention in 1992 which is an international achievement of which I think Australia can continue to be very proud. 
In 1991, John Gee was appointed by the UN Secretary General to the UN Special Commission, or UNSCOM, which had been set up to oversee the elimination of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction after the first Iran-Iraq war. In 1993, he was appointed Director of the Verification Division of the new OPCW being set up in The Hague under the Chemical Weapons Convention, charged with the complex and politically really very sensitive task of developing and implementing all the institutions and procedures necessary to verify compliance with the convention. When the convention entered into force in 1997, John became the Deputy Director General for the next six years before returning to Australia in 2003, working at the Office of National Assessments, ONA, until he was terribly, tragically struck down by the illness to which we lost him in 2007. John G. was absolutely one of the best and brightest public servants that Australia has ever produced. And I'm delighted that we continue to have this opportunity each year to celebrate his memory through this lecture. This lecture, the first of which I was privileged to give back in 2007, was established, that's 10 years old this year, was established at the initiative of Bob Matthews, who continues to be, in many ways, the prime organisational mover for which we all thank him. Uh, Rod Barton, the Lowy Institute for International Policy and the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre here at the ANU were all crucial to the getting the lecture off the ground. Lectures since then, uh, all of which in the series have focused one way or another on arms control related issues, have been delivered by Mike Kelly in 2008, Malcolm Fraser in 2009, Joseph uh, Cirincioni in 2010, Ramesh Takur with us here tonight in 2011, OPCW Director Ahmed Uzumchu in 2012, US Ambassador Christopher Hill in 2014, the Secretary of DFAT Peter Varghese in 2015, and last year the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency Director General, um, Yukio Amano. So we couldn't be more privileged than to have the 2017 lecture given by Professor Scott Sagan, one of not only America's, but the world's best known thinkers and writers on the subject of nuclear weapons. With Scott taking as his subject the world's most current nuclear problem under the title of the Korean Missile Crisis, why deterrence is still the best option. Scott is presently Munro Professor of Political Science at Stanford University, where he's taught since 1987. Before joining the Stanford faculty, he lectured in government at Harvard. 1984-85, during the Reagan administration, he was Special Assistant to the Director of the Organization of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon, and he's also served as a consultant to the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the Sandia and Los Alamos National Laboratories. Scott Sagan has written a number of discipline-leading books and many other very highly cited publications on the subjects of nuclear safety and security, nuclear war planning, the risks of nuclear proliferation, and the need to get serious about nuclear disarmament. I've had the pleasure, personally, of knowing and working with Scott for a number of years now. We're trying to remember whether it's 10 or 15, but that order of magnitude on nuclear arms control issues. We are absolutely united in our desire to rid the world of these most indiscriminately inhumane of all weapons of mass destruction. And I guess we're equally united these days in our frustration at our inability to make a hell of a lot of progress in getting there. I suspect that the only real difference between us is that where I've tended to be on public policy issues, generally an incorrigible optimist, well, I have to say with my optimism more tested on this subject than perhaps just about any other, Scott has rather tended to be more of an incorrigible pessimist. I'm waiting with bated breath, as I guess we all are, to see just how pessimistic he's now going to be on North Korea. So please welcome to the podium our 2017 John G. Memorial Lecture, Professor Scott Sagan. Thank you for that kind introduction, Gareth. I, I hope I will live up to my reputation because this is a rather pessimistic uh, talk I will give today. I do want to start by acknowledging what an honor it is to be delivering the John G. Lecture. Um, John 
He was a major contributor to arms control and disarmament, but he also spoke truth to power most famously in his reporting on the flawed nature of the Iraq study group. And as I hope to make clear to you tonight, we're in the midst of a very serious international crisis in which it is crucially important that U.S. government officials, especially the U.S. military, speaks truth to power. It's high time for the U.S. government to acknowledge that it has failed to prevent North Korea from acquiring nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles that can strike the United States. North Korea is no longer just a non-proliferation problem. It's a nuclear deterrence problem. And the gravest danger we face now is that the United States, South Korea, and North Korea will stumble into a catastrophic war that no one really wants. The good news is that the world has traveled down this kind of path before. Between 1945 and 1949, the Truman administration seeing the Soviet Union starting its bomb program and thinking of the brutality and aggressiveness of Joseph Stalin contemplated a nuclear preventive strike against the USSR, but decided in NSC 68, National Security Council Memorandum 1968 in 1950, that the resulting war would be devastating. We would win, but it would resemble the Second World War. And the Truman administration made the decision to practice containment and deterrence as a better option. In 1954, General Nathaniel Twining, the chief of the US Air Force, secretly wrote to his fellow Joint Chiefs saying that we should contemplate starting a nuclear war against the Soviet Union while we were still ahead, because otherwise we would have, and I quote, we would have to base our survival on the whims of a band of proven barbarians. President Eisenhower rejected that advice, appropriately so. In the 1960s, the Kennedy administration feared that Mao was mad and secretly approached the Soviets proposing a joint preventive strike against the test sites and nuclear facilities. The Soviets said, yet. Over time, we learned to live with the nuclear Moscow. We learned to live with the nuclear Beijing. And we can learn to live, not pleasantly and not without risk, with the nuclear North Korea. Deterrence is still the best option. Deterring North Korea will not be easy. It will not be risk-free. Accidents, false warnings, volatile leaders, and impetuous decision-making could all produce disaster. The Cold War experience offers us some lessons, but only some, because we are in a novel and grave situation today because the U.S. military must not only deter Kim Jong-un, it has to prevent Donald Trump from making some really bad decisions. The U.S. leadership must also practice the other less discussed half of deterrence. Deterrence does not just mean having a credible threat to punish somebody if he attacks you or attacks your allies. Successful deterrence also requires a promise or a belief that you will not start a war, a reassurance of a potential adversary. Because the best way or the easiest way to get the North Koreans to attack South Korea and the United States is for us to mistakenly give them the impression that we're about to attack them. In which case, a preemptive attack may be a rational thing for them to do. It has commonly been said by a number of pundits, professors, politicians even, 
that we are in the middle of a crisis that's like the Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion. It's not like the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's worse. And I believe this is true for four big reasons. First, in October 1962, Fidel Castro did not have nuclear weapons. We caught the Soviets shipping missiles. After we had said, you can't do that to Cuba, and the Soviets had told us that they wouldn't, they lied to us. And at the end of the crisis, Fidel Castro, who I don't believe fully understood the consequences, wrote to Nikita Khrushchev, advocating a nuclear strike immediately on the United States, and I quote, to eliminate such dangers forever through an act of clear, legitimate defense, however and harsh and terrible the solution would be. And when he received the message, Nikita Khrushchev said, this is insane, Fidel wants to drag us into a grave with him. Fidel had itchy fingers, but he didn't have the button. The more prudent, cautious Khrushchev did. In contrast, today, Kim Jong-un has nuclear weapons. Use intelligence estimates around 60, although it could be 10, 20 more or 10, 20 less. People are split on how certain the ability to strike different parts of the United States are, but certainly the South, to strike South Korea, Japan, and probably Guam and the West Coast, many people believe is already here. And the Cuban Missile Crisis should also remind us that we should be very cautious about intelligence estimates. After all, the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended an airstrike and invasion of Cuba because they believed that the nuclear warheads had not already gotten there. Many of them were still on the way, but we now know that a number of them had gotten there. And had the United States invaded, there almost certainly would have been nuclear use on the beaches, against the ships, and against the southern United States. Because of the ICBM capabilities, I believe that the window of opportunity for a successful US preventive war to stop the North Korean program is closed. Second reason why we're in a dangerous situation is today is it's because of preemptive war plans. In 1962, there was a grave danger because both the United States and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons for deterrent purposes, but also had the option that they hoped they would execute, if necessary, of launching first to try to destroy as much of the other side's nuclear forces as possible in a preemptive last ditch effort to limit damage. And that's why Nikita Khrushchev was so alarmed when a US U-2 accidentally flew into the Soviet airspace in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. He wrote to Kennedy, is this not a fact that an intruding American plane could easily be taken for a nuclear bomber, which might push us to a fatal step for them to launch first? Today, we are experiencing a more complex and I think dangerous three-way fear of preemption. The great Nobel laureate economist and strategist Thomas Schelling called this the reciprocal fear of surprise attack. But today, three countries have preventive options. The United States to preempt if we see that the North Koreans are about to launch. The ROK, the South Koreans, who claim that they have the right and ability to launch a decapitation attack and a preemptive attack if they believe the North is about to attack. And not to be outdone, the North Koreans have announced openly that they have a right and ability to preempt if they think the United States and South Koreans are about to launch. That puts us on a hair trigger in which a miscalculation, an accident, I'll give examples of that later, could easily lead to war. 
The third difference is that in October 1962, there was one volatile leader, Fidel Castro, who had radical misperceptions of the consequences of a nuclear war. Today, we have two such volatile and poorly informed leaders, Kim Jong-un and Donald J. Trump. Both leaders are, I believe, rational. Both leaders are, I believe, ruthless. But they are also prone to lash out impulsively at perceived enemies and are prone to give reckless rhetoric that can lead to dangerous behavior. And this danger is compounded because their senior advisors are in a poor position to speak truth to power. Kim Jong-un has executed people who have disagreed with him, who he thinks may be a threat to the regime. President Trump has not gone that far, thankfully, but he has ridiculed people who disagree with him. Anyone who has studied dysfunctional decision-making in dictatorships as a political science scientist cringed when watching the U.S. Department secretaries compete to offer obsequious praise to the president in the Trump administration's first cabinet meeting. And we should be worried that Trump, according to the New York Times, privately described National Security Advisor General, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster as a pain for subtly correcting him when he made inaccurate points in meetings. Such decision dynamics magnify the danger of war through misperception or miscalculation if people are not encouraged to speak the truth to power. And the last contrast with 1962 is a curious one because in 1962, as I suggested when describing the Joint Chiefs wanting to launch an attack against Cuba based on bad information, the hawkish Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military, was a major part of the problem. And it took a cautious, prudent Kennedy administration to insist on a quarantine instead and to be willing to make secret compromises with the Russians to prevent a war. But under US civil military relations, the civilians have a good ability to do that. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a triumph of crisis management. Today, it is the political leadership of the United States that's making dangerous threats. And it falls to the professional US military leadership to be the voice of prudence. On August 8th, President Trump threatened a US nuclear attack, not in response to a North Korean attack, which is a deterrent threat, but in response to threats. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury the world has never seen. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley, and Vice President Michael Pence have not repeated the fire and fury phrase, but have said that all options are on the table. And all options in, on the table is a code word for first strike, preventive war, including potential nuclear attacks. Then in September, President Trump belittled Kim Jong-un of the UN, making ad lib nuclear threats, calling him the little rocket man, threatening to totally destroy North Korea. This rhetoric by senior leaders is reckless and dangerous in my view. In his speech in Seoul this week, President Trump, I think, was slightly better. He largely kept on script, and he underlined the deterrent threat, which I think is necessary, 
when he said, I speak not only for our countries, but for all civilized nations when I say to the North, do not underestimate us. We will defend our common security, our shared prosperity, and our sacred liberty. That is an appropriate, in my view, deterrent threat. But he also said two things that were more alarming. One, note the term, the civilized nations. Implying that North Korea is not civilized. A way of demonizing an adversary that makes going to war against them easier. And then President Trump also hinted at preventive war again, saying we will not allow American cities to be threatened with destruction. We will not allow them to be threatened with destruction. I am worried that some senior leaders in the US military have not been consistent in their efforts to push back against such rhetoric. General McMaster, for example, criticized earlier this fall his predecessor, Susan Rice, for saying that we could tolerate nuclear weapons in North Korea. As McMaster said, she's not right. I think the reason she's not right is that classical deterrence theory, how does that apply to a regime like North Korea, a regime that engages in unspeakable brutality against its own people, a regime that poses continuous threat to its neighbors and may now pose a direct threat to the United States with weapons of mass destruction, a regime that imprisons and murders anyone who seems to be opposed to the regime. Well, that's what classical deterrence theory was developed for, for regimes that are brutal, can be aggressive, but want to stay in power. And what McMaster said could be applied equally to, to Joseph Stalin and Chairman Mao. Consider the statements of I've lost the way to move it forward. Um, consider, consider the um, looking for the clicker. Go away to the clicker. Ah, here. This summer. The ICBM test launch of July 28th demonstrated that North Korea appears to have an ability to take out, launch quickly for tests or for preemption or for retaliation, a nuclear weapon. And therefore, when people will say that we're preparing for a preventive strike, in my view, the US military should have been pouring cold water on people who are advocating a US first strike, but instead sometimes they added to the flames. Consider Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Joseph Dumford's complaint in July, quotes, many people have talked about military options with words such as unimaginable. It's not unimaginable to have military options to respond to the North Korean nuclear capability. What's unimaginable to me is allowing a capability that would allow a nuclear weapon to land in Denver, Colorado. So my job will be to develop military options to make sure that doesn't happen. Instead of reinforcing deterrence, General Dunford was alarming the North Koreans and creating a red line that the North Koreans immediately crossed. Now, it will be very difficult for the US military to take preventive war off the table. Because their job, after all, is to provide options. Their duty is to follow orders from political authorities unless they're clearly unconstitutional. The Constitution, however, says nothing about what to do if a president's orders are arguably constitutional, but also arguably crazy. And that leads, leads to utterly bizarre situations as occurred here at ANU in July when Admiral Scott Swift was asked, would he launch a nuclear strike against China next week if President Trump ordered him to do so? 
Admiral Swift should have said, that scenario is so bizarre. For the US to launch a bolt out of the blow attack, I'm not going to honor it. It's a ridiculous scenario and leave it at that. Instead he said, yes. It is very difficult for the US military to cope with this condition. And I want to be really candid and frank about the grave implications of our election of Donald Trump to the US presidency. There's a tendency, certainly in my country, and maybe you have it here on your late night talk shows, to make fun of the president's statements. I view this as a natural defense mechanism to make us feel more secure by laughing and make us feel like we're not in danger, but we are in danger. We have a president who is deeply in, ill-informed about foreign policy and defense policy. We have a president who strikes out against perceived slights. We have a president who in the technical and professional term used by the US Secretary of Defense, I mean the US Secretary of State, after he gave a briefing to the president, we have a president who is a fucking idiot. <laughs> now we laugh, and I laughed too when I read that. But that's a grave crisis that we're in. And we have to think about that and confront it very directly. In 1974, then Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger Fearing that Richard Nixon had become despondent, was drinking heavily because of the end of the Watergate affair and the impeachment hearings, secretly contacted the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, George Brown, and told him that the chairman should contact him immediately and not automatically follow military orders if Nixon independently contacted him. Schlesinger's actions were extra-constitutional, but they were really smart and wise, given the extraordinary circumstances of having an, un, an arguably unstable or at least impetuous president. I believe that we should acknowledge that we are facing a similar kind of situation every day today. Under President Trump, the senior leadership in the Pentagon must be prepared to ignore belligerent tweets, to push back against imprudent presidential policies, and I am being very precise in my language here, should be prepared to resist any orders that they believe reflect impetuous or irrational decision-making by the president. Their oath, after all, is not to an individual president, but is to support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the United States includes Article 25, the 25th Amendment, which lays out procedures to relieve an impaired president of his responsibilities. And if senior military leaders at any time believe that the president's behavior is suggesting an impaired decision process, they don't just have the right, they have a duty to contact Secretary Mattis immediately, who should then call for an emergency cabinet meeting to determine if President Trump is, quote, unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, and thus invoking the 25th Amendment, having the vice president take over. Now, I do think that that's an extreme situation, but I think we are in that extreme situation now. And we're beginning to see some positive signs that senior authorities are pushing back, at least, at some of the more extreme and reckless statements. Only some. Secretary Mattis has consistently and honorably, in my view, testified that while we would win 
in quotes, a war on the Korean Peninsula, win in the narrow sense that we would be able to conquer North Korea, and their regime and not the United States regime would be overthrown. He has also consistently said that this would be the most devastating war we have experienced since the Korean War and perhaps even since the Second World War. And I was very pleased just a few weeks ago, October 27th, that the Joint Chiefs gave a report to Congress that said that it could not guarantee the complete destruction of the North Korean nuclear weapons capability unless there was a ground invasion of the North. I think that is a responsible and conservative thing for them to do and an active act of pushing back against some of the more exuberant discussions about starting a war. But those discussions are still happening. And I want to give my own take on why I think military options are, are um, not advisable. First, some have argued, well, maybe we can have a limited attack and decapitate the North Korean regime, strike directly at Kim Jong-un and attempt to destroy the regime and prevent retaliation. That would be a gamble of epic proportions. The repeated US history of decapitation attempts shows that they're not often successful. We tried to kill Muammar Gaddafi in 1986 and failed. We attacked Saddam Hussein in 1991 and 2003, again failed to kill him. Moreover, we have no reason to think that Kim Jong-un has not sent orders to his generals, as did Saddam Hussein, saying to launch everything you have against the enemy if I'm killed in a first strike. One of the most chilling strategic documents I've ever read is the translation of the tapes of Saddam talking to his generals, giving him those orders in 1991 when he did have chemical and biological weapons as opposed to 2003 when he did not and had successfully been disarmed. And we have no reason to think that a fully indoctrinated North Korean military would refuse such orders. Their president, their dictator, is suddenly killed. What makes you think that they would say, oh, we're not going to do anything after that? The US leader should also resist the temptation to hope that a limited or surgical conventional attack on North Korean missile tests or storage sites would be effective. There's an illogic and a technical reason to be concerned that any surgical strike would not be seen as being surgical. First, the logic. For people to say, well, we could have a limited attack against North Korea, and they won't respond by attacking South Korea or US bases or potentially the US homeland, because they'll be really deterred by our overwhelming nuclear force. Think about that for a minute. We need to attack North Korea because they're so irrational that they can't be deterred in peacetime. But they are so rational that after we've attacked them, then they'll come to the senses and we'll be deterred. That's the logical fallacy, I think, of a surgical strike in this condition. The technical arguments, I think, are equally powerful. Are there reasons to believe that the North Korean nuclear arsenal is one-point safe? One-point safety is a technical term that we have used to say that under most Almost all conditions, a nuclear weapon will not go off unless it is triggered in a very intricate way by the fusing and triggering system. American nuclear weapons were not one point safe for much of the early parts of the Cold War. 
That's why it was so dangerous if one was accidentally dropped, subject to a fire, or to a conventional attack. If a US surgical strike hit a North Korean nuclear weapon, it might destroy the weapon, but it could also detonate the weapon. And would the North Koreans think, oh, the United States has just launched a very surgical strike? Or would they think, the United States has just launched a nuclear attack against us? Others put hope in ballistic missile defense. We know, however, that many ballistic missile tests have failed, even when we know the timing of the missile that we're trying to shoot down. And even though there have been some successes, of late especially regarding the THAAD, the uh, more tactical uh, forces being put into South Korea, any prudent military planner should assume that at least a few nuclear-armed missiles would penetrate the target. Estimating fatalities in a limited nuclear strike by North Korea is really hard, subject to many different scenario conditions. But Alex Wellerstein's useful modeling tool called NukeMap has been very helpful by giving anyone a chance to look at estimates based on the real life experience of the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki about what a bomb of that size or then larger would entail. They have 60 weapons and even a handful get through. Wellerstein's model suggested a 20 kiloton warhead air burst above Busan in South Korea, which we know from looking at the maps in the back of some photographs of Kim Jong-un is one of the targets, would produce 173,000 prompt fatalities. A single 20-ton kiloton weapon in Seoul would produce 137 prompt fatalities. And we know that the prompt fatalities are only a portion. If you consider longer-term fatalities, it could be double that. And then you consider conventional attacks on Seoul, conventional artillery. Consider the chemical and biological capabilities of North Korea. Consider that if there's an attack on Busan, it could destroy the nuclear power plants outside of Busan. It is not unimaginable that the first day of the Second Korean War would lead to a million people dead on a day. And then think about the North Koreans who would die in a potential retaliation. Now, let me say a bit more about this problem of the reciprocal fear of surprise attack. In 2013, the chairman of the South Korean Joint Chiefs of Staff announced that, quotes, if there's a clear intent that North Korea is about to use a nuclear weapon, we will eliminate it first, even at the risk of war. The official white paper of the Defense Department, Ministry of Defense in Seoul in 2016, even featured an illustration with multiple cruise missiles, a ballistic missile, a command launch aircraft launch missile, and a group of special forces commandos attacking what the, was labeled as the War Command Building in Pyongyang. Decapitation and command and control strikes look a lot like assassination plots and offensive regime change. And Kim Jong-un observed the US and South Korean military exercises and responded predictably in 2016, the North Korean state media reported, quotes, the right to nuclear preemptive attack is by no means the US monopoly. The Revolutionary Armed Forces of the DPRK decided to take preemptive attack as its mode of military action. And this is why Kim Jong-un believes he needs a nuclear arsenal, because he believes it is possible the United States is going to try to depose him. 
Now, certainly, weapons development appeals to his domestic audience's desire for self-sufficiency, the well-known North Korean ideology of juche, self-sufficiency. But his spokesmen have also stressed that he will not suffer the fate of Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi, both of whom gave up their nuclear programs and were later attacked by the United States. The North Korean arsenal is not a bargaining chip to get goodies from the United States. It is a potent deterrent designed to prevent the US from attacking and to disrupt an attack that is about to be launched or even disrupt an attack that has occurred by destroying US air bases and ports by preemption if possible and by retaliation if necessary. And finally, it's a means for revenge targeting the United States, American forces, and the American homeland if all else fails. And that might sound crazy. But remember, that's what Fidel Castro asked Khrushchev to do in 1962. You can tell a lot about the North Korean both retaliatory and preemptive strategy if you look at the different plots and maps behind briefings where you can see the Strategic Air Command headquarters in Omaha, the Cyber Command headquarters in San Antonio, Washington, D.C. being marked. Other ones show Busan, Nosan Air Force Base. These guys are serious. And they view this as a deterrent, but also as a preemptive option if necessary. And that's why I think we need to spend much more time analytically, but also in public discussions about how to reduce the risk of a preemptive war. How to think about things that could happen. We don't want them to happen. We want to try to prevent them. How to think through accidents, false warnings, Let me tell you some of the things that keep me up at night. If the US was to gain information that the DPRK had loaded a nuclear warhead on a missile and was moving it, would we see that as a sign of an imminent attack, as a test, as a defensive preparation, as an operational exercise? I don't know. If a radar technician accidentally put an exercise tape of a missile launch onto an online warning system, has happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, has happened during the Carter administration, would that be seen as a false warning or as a real warning? What if a US or South Korean military aircraft accidentally entered North Korean airspace? We are flying B-1 bombers near North Korea as part of our deterrent. What if one flew into the airspace or was shot down just outside the airspace as the EC-121, shown on the left, and that was in 1969 that killed 31 American personnel? Would we view that as the first act of war? Or would he decide not to retaliate, as President Nixon eventually decided? Could an ill-timed inflammatory tweet by President Trump provoke the military preparation of rush missile deployment by Kim Jong-un? We are in a, a very strange, new, dangerous world. What if the US military got an evacuation order to have all non-essential personnel, non-combatants, evacuate 
the Republic of Korea. Would that be seen by the North Koreans as a preparation for an American attack? Would it be seen as a defensive measure the United States is taking because it's concerned about a North Korean attack? I don't know, but I do know that something happened this fall that was alarming because the US military did receive, through social media, notifications to start the evacuation of non-essential personnel. And immediately, as you see here, the 8th Army Counterintelligence Advisory said, don't believe this, this was false information. And the Pentagon is under serious investigation to try to figure out what the hell happened. Was this the Russians? Possibly. Was it the North Koreans trying to spoof us or trying to give an alarm so that if we do do it in reality, people will be less likely to believe it? We do know the North Koreans had hacked into the South Korean Ministry of Defense and got war plan information. Was this some way of having disinformation? Or was this a hacker? We don't know yet. At least nothing's been announced. But that shows that even the Cold War, which supplies some good evidence about the risks of accidents, can't supply all the lessons because we're in a brave, new, dangerous world here. Instead of the Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion, we have the danger of living in August 1914 like crisis, but at Twitter speed, with social media and disinformation making the complications even worse. So let me just conclude with a, a few words that are, are, are slightly optimistic. Um, living with a nuclear in North Korea does not, in Dr. Strange Lovian terms, mean that we need to learn to stop worrying and love the bomb. It means constantly worrying about the bomb. Constantly worrying about things that go wrong and trying to address every risk. We need to convince Kim Jong-un that starting a war would lead to an unmitigated disaster for the North, particularly because his own ministers and military advisors in Pyongyang may be too frightened of the wrath of the respected supreme leader to make that argument themselves. But if I'm right, we also have to be very careful that the U.S. public understands the risks of war and that the U.S. military convinces President Trump that these risks are unacceptable today. Other American leaders should join Secretary Tillerson and Mattis in declaring that we do not seek the overthrow of the Kim regime unless he begins a war. We should modify U.S. and South Korean exercises and planning, perhaps in exchange for missile test notifications or limits in North Korea, and certainly a restoration of South Korean, North Korean hotlines would be useful. I don't think sanctions will make North Korea give up its nuclear weapons. I think it might make it more painful for them to keep them. And I think it would also be a useful signal to other potential nuclear weapon states that there are costs to violating the non-proliferation treaty. But ultimately, I think we are going to have to deter North Korea. And we're going to have to do much better at that than we have done in the first year of the Trump administration. Living with nuclear weapons is not a long-term prospect. We need to still work towards nuclear disarmament. But in the short term, if the alternative to nuclear deterrence is starting a war, I'll take nuclear deterrence. I'm happy to take questions and comments.
Well, Scott, as predicted, you've left the pessimist cheerful and the optimist depressed. <laughs> Let's open it straight up for questions now. But let me just ask you a technical question right at the beginning. Assume Trump, in a moment of reckless abandon, does take out his biscuit, his little plastic thing with the nuclear codes on it, and put it into the football or whatever it is you do to set that train of events going for the actual launch. What is the physical scope for intervention by any military personnel to stop that actual launch order being executed? Very little. The, the process was designed in for an emergency missile warning system. So the president would call the, uh, his military aide from the White House. Um, the military aide normally gets the message from the warning system, and he wakes up the president. So under that condition, the president has 10, 15 minutes to decide. He'd, ru the, he'd rush down to the, 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 an area by the situation room, and all that the biscuit has is the long code that shows that the option being chosen has been chosen by a legitimate authority, the President of the United States. And that's flash out. The Secretary of Defense could come on the line if he's been able to be reached, and he often has not been able to be reached. And the President has sole authority, and that's the only way that the code does is to say that it's the legitimate President issuing option A, option B, option C, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's in a normal condition. If the president, without having had a warning, contacts the military officer, I believe, although the system was not set up this way, that he would call the Secretary of Defense right away. Say, sir, something's going on here. You need to get here right away. We need to, so I don't know whether he would intervene in that condition. But I do think that we need to talk about that and debate that. Um, part of the uh, 25th Amendment would get invoked, I think, not based on whether the president has chosen an option that exists, but the manner in which he has chosen it. And if the manner is one that it's 3 in the morning, there's no warning out there, there's nothing going on, then I would think I would hope, and I would want to encourage them to say there's some impairment going on. But the system was not designed for that. It's a pretty reasonable assumption, in other words, that Secretary Mattis has made it pretty clear to the relevant military personnel involved in the immediate vicinity of the president handling the football, that if something like this happens, he, Mattis, has got to be contact. That's a pretty reasonable assumption, isn't it? I mean, you, don't, you can't just wave this biscuit over the thing like a pay pass, and away you go. I mean, it's... Um, no, you cannot just wave. There, there, there is a military officer... All, the, all, that, the, all that the biscuit process. code is doing is demonstrating this does come from the president. Correct. But There's no it, automatic... It's created for a condition in which the president yep. is making a rapid retaliatory or preemptive option. And I believe that if president has been given a low-level option against North Korea, and there is a warning, then I think that would happen. Hmm. If it is out of the blue, then I yeah. hope that you're right, it is a reasonable assumption, but it's only an assumption and not a fact. Sure. And there is a movement in Congress, there'll be, I believe, hearings next Tuesday, to say, should we do something different? There's a, a, a bill that has been um, written by Ted Lieu and Ed Markey, Senator Markey and Congressman Lieu, um, has not gotten very far. Only 10 senators were willing to sign it to restrict uh, first strike capabilities, to say you can do that in retaliation, but you should have congressional opinions on first strike. There are alternatives being waived, and there will be congressional hearings to try to solve this problem. Does it weigh with anyone in the United States that a first strike nuclear attack by the United States would unquestionably be a crime against humanity as a matter of international law. Does that matter, or does international law having its usual impact on American policy makers? Um, does it matter? Depends on who you ask and matters for whom. Um, I, I think um, you know from my other research, Gareth, that for the American public, I think it would matter relatively little. I used to think before doing a series of survey experiments with 
Ben Valentino that the American public would be a real constraint on any president deciding to use military force, especially nuclear force, because of the so-called nuclear taboo. Unfortunately, a set of survey experiments have shown the American public does not have a strong nuclear taboo. And I find this deeply troubling and dis disturbing. Um, most polls in the past used to ask, did Harry Truman do the right thing by dropping the bomb in 1945? And support for dropping <coughs> the bomb has gone from 85% in 1945 to 45% today. That's evidence for a taboo. But those polls never ask people to put themselves in the situation where you have to contemplate invading a country versus using a nuclear weapon. Invading a country would cause lots of American casualties. Invading a country would be costly. Dropping a bomb would be crime against humanity. We'd be killing lots of innocent people. Which would the American public choose? Well, it depends on the numbers and it depends on who the enemy is. In the polls that we did, we asked the public to read a separate representative sample to read a story that the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran, broke down. The Iranians were accused of violating that with a secret plan. The United States, in this scenario, said we would put sanctions back on, and Iran, in this scenario, attacks a U.S. ship, like in the Persian Gulf, like Pearl Harbor. Congress declares war, the president calls for unconditional surrender. And then in the experiment, we had the president told that you could either invade, 20,000 Americans will be killed, or you could launch a nuclear attack. And we varied with different control groups the number of people killed from 100,000 to 2 million, thinking surely at 2 million, the majority of the American public would say no. We'll take the risk of a conventional war. And we were wrong. 60% of the public supports using nuclear weapons. With 100,000 people being killed in that scenario, 60% supports using nuclear weapons, even if it costs 2 million to be killed. We're going to do some follow-on research to see what could we do to reduce those numbers, because those are unacceptably high in my view. It's a pretty scary article, that one you've just written on the taboo. You do acknowledge yourself at the end of that article that there are a number of other factors that would come into play in a real-world situation. There would, would be other so. voices putting other factors into the equation. I hope right. so. I hope so. But there could also be factors pushing in the other direction, too, so it's okay. alarming. That's enough of us, too. Over to you. Yeah, up the back there. And there's a roving microphone. Please introduce yourself quickly and keep it to a pretty succinct question, if you possibly can. Um, Daniel from the Crawford School of Policy. Um, my question is, um, you spoke of the state actors as being rational aggressors and the need for the US administration to implement deterrence strategies moving forward. My interest lies with the effect of non-state actors. Um, for instance, do you believe there is a future risk of um, terrorists, for example, obtaining nuclear weapons from North Korea? And how does that change the nature of the game when you've got non-state actors being involved in, in what seems to be a crisis? Um, I think if you have non-state actors, it changes the game entirely. Um, I don't think terrorists are easily uh, deterred. And therefore, with respect to non-state actors with terrorist groups, your strategy has to be something very different, which is ensure that they never get weapons. And that's why the Obama administration put as much emphasis as it did on the nuclear security summit process and improving the IAEA, the Atomic Energy Agency's nuclear security division, to try to reduce the risk that highly enriched uranium or an improvised nuclear device or a real d device could get stolen or put together by a terrorist organization. What we have in North Korea now is this really interesting problem. I think sanctions are a good thing, the reasons I suggested, but they also make it more likely that North Korea will try to sell materials to another country. And we've got to beef up, as part of a long-term strategy, our proliferation security initiative, our intelligence, and efforts to try to reduce the likelihood 
that North Korea will do again what it did with Syria and try to help Syria build weapons. Doug Keane. Uh, Doug, Doug Keane from the Office of National Assessments. Uh, thank you, Scott, for your lecture, uh, especially because you have a characteristic that reminds some of us of John Jay. That is a combination of logic and passion. Thank you. My question is impossible to answer. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on then. <laughs> oh, go ahead. But I'd like to hear you talk around it. How much one cares about arms control it depends on one's guess at how likely it is that arms will be used. One can get very different answers to all sorts of strategic questions depending on how likely you think war is. Even if the probability is extremely low, of course the consequences are huge. Keep your mic in front of me. Uh, what do you think is the likelihood that there will be a major conflict in Korea? I got a call last Friday from um, Nick Kristoff of the New York Times saying, Chris Sagan, how likely do you think, asking your question? And I refuse to answer it. I say that I don't think I know how probable it is. How probable by what time frame? How probable that we would start something or that the North Koreans would start? How probable are each one of these accident scenarios that I'm outlining? I don't know. I just know that there's a real possibility. It's not zero. And that people who say that it's zero, that we could actually get an attack or have complete confidence in deterrence I think are ignoring those real possibilities. He buried my quote in the bottom of his article, had other scholars who were saying 50%, 50, 50, 33. That's all those people are up in front, but I think I had the right answer because I don't think we know how probable they are. We do know that they're more probable than we would like, and that's why we need to work consistently to reduce the risk, whatever it is, to even lower numbers. How do you compare the probability of accidental war to deliberately initiated nuclear war? Well, I certainly... Presumably the provision of the accidental one is much higher, isn't it? Well, I certainly believe that until this particular crisis occurred. And what we are seeing is a repeat of the debates that happened in the Truman administration and the Eisenhower administration with respect to the Soviet Union we're seeing them play out today, but the difference is we don't have a Harry Truman and a Dwight Eisenhower, we have a Donald Trump. And that's a very different condition to be in. Okay, gentlemen up the back. Hi, uh, thanks. It's all right. Thanks, Professor Sagan. Uh, my name's Josh, I'm from the Corbo School. Uh, my question is this, um, assume we accept uh, North Korea as a nuclear weapons power and continues on its uh, nuclear weapons program and gains the ability to strike the United States with an ICBM. In that scenario, if North Korea chooses to invade South Korea, how confident are you that America will come to the defense of South Korea? Thanks. Great question. Um, let me make two points. One is, I should have made this a bit more clear, I believe. I think we should accept that North Korea is an illegal nuclear weapon state because they got their material by violation of a treaty that they had signed. And I think that's important. And I think we should also keep our goal of all of a denuclearized North Korea just as we should keep our goal of a denuclearized world, that they have to work in good faith towards the elimination. So we shouldn't accept it as a permanent status, but as a fact of being today, and one that is illegal in its nature. But how confident am I that the United States would come to the rescue of 
South Korea, I'm very confident. Why? Because we have 28,000 troops there. We have an estimated 100 to 300,000 American citizens living there all the time. Attacking South Korea is an attack on the United States. I hope Kim Jong-un understands that. I know that some American senators do not. You had Lindsey Graham make the shocking statement this summer that if there's a war, it'll be over there rather than over here. We forgot how many people from over here, meaning the United States, live over there now. So yes, I think the United States has skin in the game from day one. And I think that there'd be a large scale American response that would be devastating to North Korea. Yep. Uh, Professor Sagan, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering whether you think that China and or the Soviet, uh, the, the Russia, would have uh, significant roles to play in managing the situations you've set out? And what do you think Washington would best be encouraging them to do? I better be careful because whatever I say may be contradicted in the papers today because Washington, as President Trump is, talking, is in Beijing uh, today, and clearly this is one of the issues that's being discussed in some of the uh, exceedingly optimistic statements that the president has been making today uh, suggest that there are uh, discussions there. My own view is that China has much less influence on North Korea than President Trump would like. That they could do more, but they're not going to do a lot more because they don't want to see a collapse in the humanitarian crisis that would occur and the crossing of the border would occur if there's a complete collapse of, uh, an emergency collapse of North Korea. And because even though they don't like North Korea getting nuclear weapons, they don't want to see a united Korea that is a US ally on their border. So I think they could do more, but I don't think they're likely to do a whole lot more. And even if they did, I don't think it's going to get Kim Jong-un to give up his nuclear weapons. Just Anthony Burke from UNSW Canberra. Just to follow up on this, should we be afraid of China entering a war um, between the South Koreans and the US and North Korea? Yeah. Um, yes, we should. Um, there have been reported exercises in China on the North Korean border in recent uh, in the recent years, suggesting that they have plans to go in. Now, whether this is to go in, try to seize the weapons, establish a, a, a zone of interest, and not combat the United States, or whether there could be escalation through the decision that, no, we're going to defend North Korea. They're not the same kind of ally that they were in, in 1950. That's quite clear. But I have seen reports and have heard from Chinese generals don't underestimate the like of, remember how many people we lost in the Korean War, that we're not here to see you unite North Korea. Now, it would be a different condition, but yeah, we should worry about this greatly. Yeah, up in the corner. Oh, okay. All right, and then behind you after that. Where you go? Okay. Um, hi, uh, Steve Beresford from the Department of Defense. Um, you talked a little bit about reducing the risk uh, of preemptive war. Inevitably, that would require some level of acceptance from the United States about the condition that North Korea is in. How or where would you start in, uh, in terms of balancing the political kind of fallout from that uh, in, in accepting uh, North Korea's nuclear status? Um. Well, first off, I would stop demonizing North Korea. I think this is really worrisome. Um, President Trump, by belittling the North Korean leadership, is making it seem likely, or more likely, or less onerous, that we could actually try to attack North Korea. So that's the first thing you do, is stop doing that and treat the North Korean people 
There's people who, require, who have rights and should be treated appropriately. Now, I thought the speech in Seoul was a bit better than others in the past in trying to do that. Um, but I, I do worry that some of the rhetoric coming out of Washington makes it easier to go to war and therefore less likely to accept uh, uh, deterrence. I think politically, the far right would say, you've, you've caved in, this is bad. But I think the vast majority of Americans, if really educated about what the consequences of a war would be, and that's why I like this report to Congress, would say, whew, we can accept a nuclear North Korea as a short-term solution, even if we don't want to see this uh, uh, as a long-term perpetual state. And I think that could be persuaded. Now, let me, I've said a number of negative things about President Trump today. Let me give one positive thing. Maybe it's because Gareth has come forward and I'm getting his optimistic <laughs> vibe being contagious here. Um, I've written in the past about the phenomenon I call the commitment trap. That there's danger that a president could make a threat for deterrent purposes, it fails, and then he, and potentially she, could feel I've got to act because otherwise my credibility will be never trusted again. Think about John Kennedy saying, I should have told the Russians it doesn't matter if you put missiles in Cuba, but now that I said don't do it, and they said they wouldn't do it, and they did it, now I've got to go to war, or I've got to do something, I've got to get these out, and the Joint Chiefs said, yes, that's why you've got to do something. One positive thing about Donald Trump is that he's terribly inconsistent, <laughs> and backs away from things that he said while denying that he ever said them. <laughs> and I hate to make a strategic virtue out of inconsistency, but in this respect there is a slight benefit to this. And thus far he has gotten away with it among his base. We'll see. So I think you're raising a really important and difficult question. I think that's absolutely dead right. But just on the question of a negotiate, because Trump has started to use the N-word, I mean admittedly totally inconsistently, erratically and implausibly, but what does, what in your judgment would be enough to put on the table from the North Koreans to get us to a stage, and reciprocally from the Americans, which will get us to the stage at least of a freeze on further development, if not denuclearization, which is another universal way. Yeah, I, I, I think no, opening gambit positions will be the North to have the United States pull out of South Korea, and for the United States to say, well, you've got to denuclearize before we even talk to you, right? Yeah. And that's where they are. I'm talking about the real conditions. In the real conditions, I think there'd be an interest not just because it is a bargain, but because it could really be safe to tell the North Koreans, we want to get notified of any missile launches. We want you to limit the range of things. We want to certainly not do things that we consider deeply provocative, like launching towards Guam or detonating in space. And in exchange, we might be willing to give up some of our exercise work with the South Koreans, not just because it's part of a deal, but because some things that we've done are dangerous. So it wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing to have that. Now, I haven't worked out the details. I don't think anybody has, but we should be doing that kind of work, both privately and, I think, I hope, inside the US government. A lot of those details have, of course, been worked out in the past, including the mid-90s negotiations, right. in which I had a role as foreign minister, including in the early 2005-06 negotiations, right. which I was a close observer at International Crisis Group. And I have to say, in both those situations where notional agreement was reached, it was at least as much the fault of the West walking away and being perceived to walk away from its commitments as it was the fault of the other side that led those agreements to break down. I don't think that's true of the 2011-2012 further attempt to find a solution negotiated to this. I think that was unequivocally Kim Jong-un's responsibility to walk away from that. But what confidence can that record of even under comparatively much saner and more credible administrations. What confidence can that give us in the possibility of a negotiated solution to holding? Gareth, you're supposed to be the optimist here, and I'm supposed to be <laughs> the pessimist. The answer is it gives me very little confidence. There we go. Okay, up the back. Hi. Hi. 
This is kind of related question, but uh, my name is Daniel, and I'll be serving in the Korean Army next year. So this is kind of related issue for me. Um, uh, it's not really a laughing matter, but <laughs> uh, so I I always wonder why don't the U.S. governments of past and current consider signing a non-aggression pact with the North Korean government in exchange of complete denuclearization of the North Korean uh, nuclear weapons? Yeah. Um, I think there have been talks about doing that, but I think for North Korea to give up its nuclear deterrent in exchange for a piece of paper and a promise would be a foolhardy thing for the North Koreans to accept. It. I think they'd like to see an armistice, and that may be part of uh, see the armistice turn into a, um, a real peace. But a non-aggression pact is not is easily broken. A complete nuclear disarmament would not be as easily broken, and that therefore, I think Kim Jong Un would have no interest in going that way. Why has the U.S. been so cautious about accepting that basic demand to to change the armistice into a permanent peace? I mean, that's always, to me, fairly surprisingly, been right at the top of the North Korean wish list, and it's never something on which we've seemed to be prepared to be delivering. Um, you would know better than I would, Gareth. I, I, I find this very puzzling because it's something that I would certainly accept. People will argue, well, no, this is premature. We have to do this from strength, etc. But that's an argument I think that we've heard too many times and it becomes an excuse for, Ill act for inaction. There's one other question from me, if I may, about the... There, oh, okay, there, there are some hands up now. I've been waiting for some to show up. There's one over here. Okay, well, let's one see. One here and one there. Okay, okay. Where are you going? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Chris Heath. Uh, I'm a postgrad student here at ANU. I want to sort of move a bit beyond the deterrence aspect of your presentation this evening and ask in the event that um, deterrence fails and there is some form of nuclear exchange on the Korean Peninsula. Where would that leave global non-proliferation post that event? Um, I've often thought that the first use of nuclear weapons since 1945 could be a very good thing for non-proliferation or could be a disaster, depending on how it turns out. So for example, a nuclear use between India and Pakistan if the Pakistani army does this and stops an Indian assault on Pakistan, even if it stays very limited, I think that would be a disaster for non-proliferation because many other countries would say, oh, well, you can use nuclear weapons and it won't be a disaster. Right? On North Korea, I think it could if there was a limited use and the North Korea regime survived. I think that would be a bad thing for non-proliferation because other countries could say, oh, well, we could use nuclear weapons too and survive. If, however, it led to the swift and utter destruction of the Kim regime, then I think it would be a good thing for non-proliferation because other countries would say, oh, well, look what happened if you violate the treaty and mess with the United States and its allies in this way. So it really depends on what the final outcome was. Okay. So Tracy Douglas from the Department of Defence. In your uh, presentation, you talked uh, quite a bit about uh, what you know, the US public, the US military, US Congress, US Senate uh, could do to bring the administration to a point at which deterrence was a reasonable choice to make. My question would be, what could allies and partners in the region do to contribute to that? And I think, you know, I'm asking from an Australian perspective, but also the Republic of Korea, Japan, and some of the other partners and allies in the region. Well, this is partly why I'm here. <laughs> um, I hope that the Australian government and others are saying, no, these plans to have a limited attack or a major attack are really wrong-headed. 
and that you need to practice deterrence as complicated and as uncertain as it is, at least for the immediate term. I was pleased when the Moon government said, incorrectly, I believe, that you can't initiate war without us. We get a vote in the matter. I don't think that's technically true. But I'm glad that they said that, because that's putting extra pressure. And I think that instead of just standing by and watching us drift into this kind of crisis, I think allies here and elsewhere in the Pacific should very firmly say that we think a war in the Korean Peninsula is unacceptable. There is no military option now. And that deterrence, with all its faults, is the best that we can do right now. This does not mean we should embrace it. We shouldn't marry it. We shouldn't love the bomb. But it does mean that we need to really loudly and often tell individuals in Washington that some of the rhetoric that you're using and some of the options that you're discussing are not acceptable. Scott, thank you from me for a lecture in the finest tradition, I think, of the G legacy and in the finest tradition of this uh, memorial lecture. But let me pass it over to Michael Wesley to offer the last word. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it falls to me to thank our 10th anniversary John G. Memorial Lecture, lecturer, Professor Scott Sagan. I overlapped briefly at the Office of National Assessments with John G. when he was just back from his work with the Iraq Study Group. And I remember thinking to myself uh, just how extensive his knowledge and experience were and how rigorous his judgments were. And it reminded me of that when Professor Sagan started out by stating very, very bluntly that North Korea has moved from being a proliferation problem to a deterrence problem. I think that was an incredibly important uh, statement to make at the outset. And that this, as he went on to say, is a deterrence problem being managed by two inexperienced and highly volatile leaders. Some fascinating logic coming out of that. I think the risk, as Professor Sagan has reminded us, is that by making fun and retreating to laughter at both of these leaders, both Kim and Trump, we tend to ignore the seriousness of the situation. There's also the fact that like a flash of lightning on a dark night, the North Korean crisis has drawn attention to a range of broader destabilising trends uh, in the nuclear and conventional weapons domains, predominantly here in Asia. And as a little bit of self-publication uh, or promotion, uh, do keep an eye out for a College of Asia and the Pacific publication that's coming out in a couple of weeks that contains 12 essays from 12 of our experts on these uh, very dangerous uh, dynamics. So, Professor Sagan, your lecture reminds us that the beginnings of dealing responsibly with such an in incalculable and unthinkable state of affairs is to begin with rigorous disciplined analysis. Yours has been an artful combination of keeping in mind how serious the consequences of the current dynamics are without being overwhelmed or overawed. I think all of us are in wild agreement with your conclusions tonight and would agree very much with you that the challenges ahead lie in convincing uh, some of our political leaders of the logic of what you've laid out before us. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Professor Scott Sagan for uh, delivering the 10th uh, John G. Memorial Lecture.